complete political and economic disarray. We need to break all of what's going on down in a reasonable and rational way right now. First things first, the auto strike that's going on with the UAW has just led to one of the hottest car auctions quite a while. One of the reasons for that is dealers believe that they need to stock up on vehicles so they don't run into inventory shortages and therefore end up with net fewer sales. Car dealers are now overpaying for vehicles from Ford, Stellantis, and GM, Wranglers, Broncos, pickup trucks, you name it, just to have enough of these vehicles because there's an anticipation that as these strikes go on, Buyers are going out, okay, now I better buy my car now before prices go up because of the strikes. Dealers are like, well, I better go buy now and stock up, so I'm ready for those buyers. And Ford, Stellantis, and GM are kind of like, uh, maybe we're making progress. Ford, at least, seems to be the one making the most progress. Their stock up 1.89%, and they're actually getting a lot of social clout for this. A lot of folks saying Ford is actually trying to look out for the worker. Finally, even though they maybe haven't been, finally they're being reasonable with their negotiations. At least that's the way this is being talked about in social media. Whereas Mary Barra, the CEO of GM, and to some extent Stellantis, are being chastised for still being corporate versus a worker. That's really what this is coming down to, despite the fact that obviously costs at these companies have skyrocketed and the transition to electric vehicles is being chastised by uh, you know, well, politicians, specifically those on the right. I mean, we're going we're gonna to go through this in a moment as well, but we just had Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, Carolina absolutely destroy the plan to incentivize a transition to electric vehicles in her freedom plan. We'll go through that a little later. Point is, a lot of drama around all of this. And what's the bottom line? The bottom line is, in the short term, the longer these strikes go on, the more you can actually expect short-term vehicle price inflation. Unfortunately, that vehicle and price inflation is going to affect consumer prices. Consumer prices are usually weighed with about a 4.8 to 5% weight on new and used car prices. Problem with that is what ends up happening when those go up, we end up potentially getting hotter CPI reports, which then circles right back to the Federal Reserve saying, see, we still have work to do on this inflation fight. Guess we'll have to stay higher for longer. And quite frankly, that's exactly what we were told once again yesterday when we finally started getting Fed speak. One member of the Fed said, hey, you know what? Not only are we going to have to stay higher for longer, but still open to one more rate hike. Then you had another member of the Fed come out yesterday and say, you know what? Maybe uh, we need a few more rate hikes. Plural. Yeah. Hikes rhymes with yikes. And that's exactly what the stock market pulled off yesterday was a yikes. See, remember how there was so much enthusiasm for the artificial intelligence revolution, how it's going to explode GDP everywhere? And don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of what AI is doing for chips. It is actually breathing life into the chips industry because there wasn't much life beforehand, okay? Like things were still pretty crappy and you were definitely in a chips recession. AI breathed life into the chip sector. But it also propped up a lot of software and service companies. And it's questionable as to whether or not these software service companies, SaaS companies, are actually going to generate revenues. Now, you have a double-edged sword. The stock market and financial conditions have rallied in such a way that the Fed's like, oh, we have to do more to get inflation down. This is insane. The economy's too hot. GDP's too hot. And it may have risen up on this idea that AI is about to make everything much more productive and GDP is gonna explode and inflation's gonna happen. Even though technically inflation or uh, this innovation should be disinflationary, that's been the case. It's been this idea that, well, if the economy's so strong, let's hike more. But if the economy just got propped up on Fugazi magic of AI software sales that aren't gonna come, well, that's gonna go away. And then when that goes away and the Fed's like, oh, yeah, we've hiked a lot because GDP is so strong, we're so good. Well, then all of a sudden, then you go, Wait a minute, now we're severely damaging the real estate market. Oh no, it appears we're going to have to suffer even more damage in the economy and now all of a sudden you've got a financial crisis on your hands. Let's break down how this could play out and what indicators are actually suggesting things could be getting worse before they get better. Right after a message from our sponsor, Weeble. Now, before we keep going, a quick note from our sponsor, Weeble. Paid sponsor, but you know what? They're also about to pay you. Because if you sign up for Weeble, not only do you get free socks, 
but you could earn 5% on your cash as you're waiting to pull the trigger or buy the dip. Now, I actually like that a lot because I'm worried that sitting on cash for too long could create an opportunity cost. But if your cash is ready to go and you see an opportunity on Weeble, you know you could trade on it right away. I personally like sorting by either market cap, small or big, or by sorting based on the movement in the day to see where there might be some action to trade on. If I find an opportunity, what I really enjoy about Weeble is that I can hop in and immediately place option trades, calls, sell puts, sell calls, you name it. Or I could get my Fib retracement lines up pretty fast and start checking out, hey, are my trends okay here? Or are we about to keep tanking? Somewhat like, oh, we won't talk about that one. But the TA was telling us and it was all on Weeble. So one thing I love is Weeble. And I encourage you to check it out. Not only are your securities SIPC insured up to $500,000, but your cash can be secured up to $900,000 in some cases. Check out the terms and conditions at a Weeble and make sure to use my link in the description down below. I really appreciate it. It helps the channel out a lot. And I hope you enjoy using Weeble as much as I do, because quite frankly, I use it every single day. Oh boy, alarms are going off. <laughs> yes, uh, this is unfortunately bearish and we're gonna have to be clear about this bearishness and how this will all end up connecting with the real estate market stock market and this ai revolution that maybe isn't or wasn't see if markets are expecting the ai revolution is going to create such a gdp boost and therefore inflation expectations rise and the fed gets aggressive but then the gdp boost doesn't come what happens we end up suffering higher rates unnecessarily for longer we're going to talk about this warning bell in a moment but consider this for a moment the Fed is convinced they need to stay potentially as high as having 5% interest rates through the election next year. That's wild. Through the election, everybody has been pretty much of the belief, at least a lot of people have been, that rate cuts are going to conveniently start right before the election. Maybe that'll be true. But if we're in a recession going into the election, I don't think Joe Biden's going to make it. And I'm not talking about his health. I'm legit talking about the economy here. Uh, the economy is how people vote. People vote based on the sentiment of their pocketbook and everything is so much substantially more expensive today. Even if inflation is deemed to be low, if the Fed's still at 5%, we've got some serious problems. But what about these alarm bells going off and uh, could it end up damaging the stock market more? Well, unfortunately, yes. And this is a report from Bloomberg Intelligence. And what they argue is that the Russell 2000 index of small caps has confirmed a bearish trend after breaking below important support levels. Now, the small caps breaking this trend is a broad market warning sign. Small caps are usually deemed to be the most sensitive to a recession. And even though economists have sort of removed this idea that we're definitely going to have a recession from forecasts, which on one hand seems good, it's also another reason the Fed's like, hey, we'll just stay higher for longer. But the problem is if that's set up on Fugazi GDP expectations because of AI that isn't, then the first thing that sells off are small caps. Your more risky stocks, your speculative stocks, your stocks that started memeing in the summer, those are the ones that sell off first. Your Redfins, your Open Doors, some of these other smaller companies, the Matterports, whatever. All the spec small ones that you don't want to be in going into a recession sell off first. That's exactly what started happening. And that's exactly the support we just broke right here. Now, we could end up getting something like we got at, uh, you know, around the banking crisis, which where we had this sort of zigzag below the moving average entirely possible, led to the rally that we saw in the summer, or it could set up for something worse and a larger, broader market decline. See, history shows that extreme moves lower for small caps is often a precursor for more challenges as the ratio between the Russell 2000 and Russell 1000 hovered near a 22 year low. An analysis of similar past occurrences by sentiment trader found there were not a lot of reasons to expect imminent or sustained positivity and turnaround. The analysis looked at times this ratio fell to its lowest in, a, in at least a decade, and it did so for the first time in at least 30 sessions. Over the next three months, the total return on small caps exceeded large caps only three out of the last 15 times, and those were just barely. In other words, this signal certainly doesn't signal small cap outperformance, and when you don't signal small cap outperformance, 
you generally signal the market's pricing in more fear. Market's pricing in more fear because higher for longer is actually likely to cause severe damage. I believe a lot of the bears are actually correct when they say inflation for now is gone, but it's going to lead to so much pain that markets can actually rotate substantially lower. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. We want to be able to be bullish and look through the pain and, and dollar cost average and make it. But the thing that could really cause problems is the real estate market. So this weekend, what am I doing? I'm going open housing, baby, because that's what you should be doing as well. You go to the markets. I'm getting on a plane right after I finish this video. I'm getting on a plane and I'm flying to my market. I'm flying to my market well, one of my markets, uh, for the next two days to study every single open house and interview every single agent that I can because I don't care about the data and what the comps said from June. Sales in June, most areas of the country in July are the highest of the entire year, okay? Bottom Jan 1, it's basically been straight up into June, July. Essentially straight up. It's because as inflation's been coming down, people are like, great, inflation's coming down, rates will come down soon enough. I'll buy a home, speculating that I'll only have this 7% mortgage for a few months and J-Pal will cut. Oh crap, that few months is now gonna turn into maybe a few years. That's going to create more pressure from the real, on the real estate market and it wakes up buyers to the idea that, dang, you know, why don't I just wait a couple of years? And so that's what we're starting to see happen. Real estate is hitting a wall. And you don't even have to want to wait for the data to see that. If you wait for sold data, you're way behind. If you're one of the people leaving the comments going, but Kevin, inventory is still so low. It does not matter what inventory is. What matters is the ratio of homes to buyers. That's called your month supply indicator. And right now, most indicators still haven't updated through the end of August. Okay, you've got lagging data. But what you should be doing is looking in your market, looking at those new listings that are hitting the market and going, Oh, that's priced $30,000 below the comps. Let me, uh, let me do uh, something hard. Pick up the phone. Hey, uh, listing agent, I, I saw you just listed a place at you know, 123 Main Street. Just wondering, uh, did you get any offers? You know, I've got somebody looking at it. I'm a broker. No, no, you know, uh, we just listed it. I haven't gotten any offers yet. Okay. In the real estate community, that's a sign of, please bring me a lower offer. Like, clearly we're not that hot. Otherwise, we would have already had offers. Hot deals get offers right away. You need to understand this. I understand this. I run a real estate startup. This, this, is, this is what started my career is real estate. By the way, I, uh, the company that's doing our fundraise, they told us that uh, they believe we just broke the 48 hour record for fundraising out of every single startup they've ever fundraised with before via Regulation A fundraise. That's crazy. Because they've got like hundreds, either hundreds or thousands, I can never remember. But they've got lots of clients. And they're pretty well, well known in, in the uh, fundraise community. And that's really cool. So seriously, like, shout out to everybody in the community who's going to househack.com. You're reading the offering circular. You're watching the videos on my househack playlist. So you really understand what we're doing. And uh, uh, realize we, we, we have no fees either for you to invest. You can invest... ACH, just a bank connection. You can invest with a credit card if you want to get points. Uh, you could wire us money, doesn't matter. It's obviously cheapest for the company if you wire or ACH us money, but we just want to make it easy for you to be a part of this. Uh, we think we're going to, knock on wood, I can't make any guarantees. I'll be careful with what I say, okay? There's risk when you invest, but we think we're going to make so much money with this money, with this company that it doesn't matter, uh, you know, a little bit of fees that we can cover to have you be with us, uh, which is great. So uh, again, read the prospectus, there's risk to any investment, have to be careful with what you say. So, uh, okay, good. Listen, we're, this, I, we've said it since January 1, the volatile Nike swoosh is what I believe. We have not actually gotten a volatile Nike swoosh, we've gotten a straight Nike swoosh. We need the volatility. Okay. The reason we didn't get a volatile Nike swoosh is because when we had the banking crisis, everybody's like, this is going to lead the Fed to cut rates sooner. Nope. Clown mode didn't happen. And then it's like, well, then we get the AI boom. That's going to lead to so much more in earnings, right? I'm like, maybe for chip companies, but not SaaS companies. Oh, well, that's disappointing then. Sell off, sell off, sell off. So we're getting the volatility. Okay. That volatility is still going to lead the Fed to be more aggressive. That's going to hurt real estate. This November, December, buckle up. There are going to be so many deals. I, I'm convinced. That's why I'm going to spend the entire weekend uh, making sure I'm studying uh, this uh, one market that I'm flying to. And the next week, I'll be flying to some other markets. Next schedule of releases for the CPI report market calendar for October 12th.
If you have not yet marked your calendar, make sure you mark your calendar for October 12th for the CPI release. Uh, then we want to mark our calendar for the jobs report as well. That's going to come out a little bit earlier in October. Uh, let's see here, schedule of releases. So you're marking your calendar for October 12th CPI. That's really important. Mark your calendar for November 1st for the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee. Next jobs report's going to come out not on the first of the month, but instead on October 6th. And then mark your calendar for next Friday as well. That's the 29th, I think is the 29th. Yeah, it's the 29th, next Friday. Mark your calendar for next Friday. Reason for that is next Friday, we are raising the price on the Noobverse Pro Crash Course Resale. 79 bucks, you're gonna get an insane amount of value on this. Those courses I expect will be worth 150 to 250 dollars once they actually launch and we actually get content in and we get them fully marketed. Right now, if you buy them for 79 bucks, you're locking in a price at $79 and you will get all of the content in those crash courses, which is a pretty good deal. Uh, and I want to let you know about this. We programmed something in on the website. This is important for you to know if you're interested in these. When you go to meetkevin.com, watch this, okay? These are the new Burst Pro crash courses. If you select two or more, you get an increasing discount on everything. Look, select two, 10% discount, right? Look at this. You select another, it goes to 12% on the entire order, right? And it can't kind of keeps going. See, now you're at 16%. It's kind of cool. We programmed this in. We think it's pretty cool. Uh, but yeah, each of these, $79 right now, they're on pre-sale, so there's no content yet, uh, but we expect they will go up. Uh, well, they will go up, not only next Friday, uh, but once the content actually comes out, which will come out over probably the next 60 to 90 days, we'll work these courses out one at a time. Uh, and then once the course releases, it'll probably be double the price. So anyway, uh, keep that in mind. That's next Friday's the expiration. Okay, so we talked bearish signal. We talked uh, unions. You know what's wild, what just happened in California? Gavin Newsom, his entire state legislature just voted 69 to 4 and 36 to 2. That's a big pass, okay? It's like mostly Democrats anyway. It's like 77% Democrats, okay? But anyway, they just voted to require trucks in autonomous trucks. Wait, to require drivers in autonomous trucks. Get it? If you have a full self-driving Tesla semi-truck, there has to be a driver in it, is what they're saying. Gavin Newsom just vetoed that. A slap in the face to the Teamsters Union. It's like, what? You're a Democrat. You're supposed to be bowing down to the unions. And he's not. People are saying the reason for this is he's trying to come across as appealing to people who are not all in on unions, but instead people who see the future coming. That there will be driverless vehicles in the future. And if the laws are safe around those self-driving vehicles, then it's okay to have self-driving trucks. This is, this is crazy because truckers hate Newsom. He made it so hard with not only diesel prices, but with the regulations for truckers, it's almost impossible to be a smaller trucking business in California. It's insane. Like my heart goes out to the truckers. But we also know that in the future, it's all just gonna be robots driving all this stuff. But, you know, the next nice thing you could do is make it easier in the meantime until we get to that point. But it was very interesting. Now, Ford obviously got uh, applauded for getting closer to a deal uh, with uh, uh, with our friends uh, over at the United Auto Workers Union. Uh, and then the other things that we've got going on, there's a lot. Uh, we've got um, DeSantis. Oof, 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 oof. DeSantis, um, people are basically waiting for him to drop out. And uh, this, is, uh, this is somewhat uh, painful for DeSantis, but take a look at this. Here's a piece entitled and political called Waiting for Him to Drop Out, drop out DeSantis Influence Nosedives. And they did interviews with both people who wanted to be named and not named. Uh, and it could all be rigged. You know, it could all be, uh, you know, the, the, the media just doesn't want DeSantis, so they're trying to get rid of him. Who knows? But look at some of the things that they're saying. They're suggesting that college boards with DeSantis appointees are rejecting job candidates with ties to the governor. Basically, people who are associated with the governor, they're not getting hired right now. Wild. Uh, not only that, but listen to this. Interviews with nearly two dozen lobbyist political content, uh, consultants and lawmakers revealed that DeSantis' struggles as a presidential candidate have already eroded his influence in Florida. And there's a widespread expectation his candidacy will end in failure. Now, it's just a matter of time. And what they're doing is people are blaming his, hard, uh, his, his hardballing nature against D Disney, potentially, which is wild because a lot of people are like, oh, go woke, go broke, like screw Disney, right? But then when he ended up wielding the governorship 
as a hammer, they say, they say that people then start wondering if they themselves are the nails. In other words, when you go too aggressive, people start getting concerned, wait a minute, like I could be your target next. And DeSantis has actually done some pretty crazy things, like powerful things, in terms of getting the legislature in Florida to basically be what's known as his conveyor belt. Like they'll do whatever he wants and pass whatever he wants. Now all of a sudden, you've got the legislature that's actually like, yeah, no, that's not us anymore. We're not, we're not interested in this. In fact, now there's talk that the sentiment against DeSantis has turned into a slow moving coup, an overthrow of DeSantis. And this is, comes at the same time as people like, you know, Kenny G over at Citadel. Oh boy, I gotta talk about Kenny G and Citadel. But anyway, Kenny G and Citadel, uh, you know, well, Kenny G himself, he's donated tens of millions of dollars to both uh, Gavin, or, um, DeSantis' 2018 and his 2022 campaign. Now, not anymore. Nope, not interested anymore. Instead, Kenny G's like a little uncertain that DeSantis' policies have maybe gone a little too far and maybe he's not the right guy fit for the presidential job. You want to know something else, though, about Kenny G and Citadel? This is a pisser. You ready for this? Citadel was actually inappropriately marking long trades as short. Sorry, I got that backwards. They were inappropriately marking short sales as long, which basically made it seem like they weren't as short as they actually were. Maybe this is why there's been so much of this naked shorting and fail to deliverance going on. Maybe Wall Street Bets is actually right that the suits have been trying to screw retail and the SEC just fined Citadel for literally lying about how they were marking trades as long instead of short. Okay, so what'd they get fined? Probably got a massive fine, right? Well, consider this. Last year, Citadel made $16 billion. 16 billies. That's a lot of money. Let's assume you made $75,000, okay? Let's compare this. How much do you think it would be fair for you to get fined making $75,000 if you got slapped in the face by the SEC for fraud and deceit. Probably 10 grand, 20 grand, maybe a little bit of jail time. How about $32? That's the income equivalent that Citadel got fined. $32 on $75,000, also known as $7 million on $16 billion. Yep, rich keeps getting richer in this country, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. And that's why, like, legitimately, I, I, I try, I mean, people are like, oh, but Kevin, yeah, man, man, man. Like, I built this channel on helping people build assets, on getting into real estate, on building your income, on having the motivation to go for the promotion, to get your license, to get a better job, to get educated, to go make money in this capitalist world so you can invest in real estate and start whatever. That's what I built this channel on. And I wholeheartedly believe that if you don't do that, you're going to get left behind. Every single person watching this should be thinking to themselves, what's next in my career? What's next in making sure I get some more passive income? What's next in getting another side hustle going? I don't care if you're 50, if you're 60, you're 70, you could get a side hustle too. You know, wanna know one of my favorites right now? It's, it's a little tougher, uh, but uh, it's actually not very difficult and you can do it pretty fast. So you know, back in the day, we used to talk about having the big Matterport scanning cameras. Forget the big one. Okay, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to metkevin.com slash 3D. Yeah, that's a paid affiliate link. But anyway, you go to metkevin.com slash 3D. You get that camera on a monopod. Then you're gonna get your iPhone. I think it, I don't know if it works on Android. Look that it works on Android first. You're gonna download the Matterport Capture app. You could literally scan an entire house with a 3D tour, 15 minutes. Easy, 15 minutes. Give yourself 30 minutes to turn the lights on and make everything look nice at first, put a little more care in, you're good. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go to contractors, realtors, property managers, insurance agents, uh, you know, handy folk, I don't care. Anyone who deals with properties, retail, who has a store, go to every single Airbnb owner. I don't care what you gotta do. What you're gonna do is you're gonna say, I'd like to offer you a free virtual tour. It's gonna take you 30 minutes. You do the first one for free, 30 minutes. The next one, you're gonna go 99 bucks. Now all of a sudden, 99 bucks for 30 minutes worth of work with drive time, call it an hour, 100 bucks for an hour worth of work, and it's literally pushing a button and moving a monopod around. Come on, folks, you can do this.
Anyway, so let me know if you'd like a more detailed video on uh, on some aspects of that. I'm happy to do that. So uh, government's now shut, uh, setting up for uh, a big old shutdown as well. Things are getting worse with McCarthy. We're basically uh, setting up for that shutdown now. Uh, that's probably going to have the impact on federal employees once again going without pay. The problem with this is people are like, oh, well, they'll get caught up in pay. Yeah, legally, they are required to get caught up in pay unless you're like a military contractor. But the problem is when, when the government fails its basic duty of providing people pay, providing people uh, a budget for the country, not only do national parks and museums close, but the TSA workers working at the airport, they can't work for free. So if they skip payday, they're going to have to go get another side hustle job or something just to be able to pay their bills. They can't just tell their landlord, I'll catch you next time because they're, uh, you know, on basically they're working without pay. So people out of force end up not showing up at work. And this ends up causing problems because now you halt federal inspections for chemicals and drinking water. You, uh, you potentially slow the issuance of new Medicare cards or, uh, you know, you're still supposed to get your social security checks and your Medicaid, Med Medicare checks, but there's concern that poor families aren't going to get the food aid that they're used to getting, which averages somewhere around $56 a month. I know a lot of people are like food aid for the poor. They should go work, bro. It's 56 freaking dollars a month for these people just to try to help have some more food on the table to survive. Ah, oh, crazy. The usage of food banks, by the way, right now is at all time highs. It is, it is very tough out there. Uh, it is a tough time. It's, it, the inflation has made it very difficult uh, for, for people just to be able to go grocery shopping. Remember Hershey's last year? This was insane. Hershey's last year told us, what did they tell us? Not what's on screen, because that's my next topic. Hershey's last year told us our sales are going up because gas station sales are going up. And people are like, wait, why are gas station sales going up? You wanna know why gas station sales were going up? It brings tears to my eyes. Gas station sales were going up for Hershey's candy bars because people are so freaking miserable going to pump their gas that they have to go twice to fully fill up their tank. They only fill up their tank halfway because they can't afford filling it up all the way. But to try to make themselves feel a little bit better, they get a chocolate bar. And Hershey's is like, wow, our sales are going up because people are miserable and they need some happiness in their life. How do you think that's gonna turn out in the election? Yeah. Shh, it's bad. <sighs> Oil super cycle is here, says JP Morgan. We could be in super cycle four. Upside risk to oil is 150. In the medium terms, probably going to be at least 100. Reasons for this, well, first of all, their call options on oil. I don't know, I'm being jaded. <laughs> I don't know if they have call options. But here are the reasons they give. They say that higher for longer rates limits investment into oil rigs. So you're actually drilling less because rates are so high. You're better off just parking your money in cash. See, higher cost of equity, higher break-evens, blah, 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 blah. Also... People have been talking about this fear that we're at peak oil. And so the oil companies are investing less into plants and, and wells and pumps and drilling because they're like, well, if we're at peak oil, let's just use what we have. Yeah, that's JP Morgan on the super cycle for you. Oh man, I really, I'll let you know what I see this weekend. But so far, every single agent I'm talking to, they're like, I don't know, man, there's some problems coming to the market. And that's going to lead to opportunities. But listen to this. I've got agents coming up to me going, Kevin, I, was, I thought I was going to be excited. I've got a million dollar listing. Usually it's like million dollar listings. It's like, hell yeah, it's like the TV show. Like, let's go, you're a million dollar listing agent. It's going to be two million dollars, whatever, right? But everybody else in the industry is like, yeah, line up and pull your ticket. Take your free multi-million dollar listing. None of them are selling anyway. Look at the markets, that high end smack. I don't buy in the high end anyway. I don't, I don't do that. I, I, I like to buy middle of the road stuff. Not the super cheap stuff where I need a gun to collect rent. Sorry. I also don't do the super fancy stuff where I got the bougies. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I like normal Americans. I gotta go sit down and have a beer with after a long day of work. I understand people are like, oh, long day of work, Kevin. Have you had a long day's work? Uh, yeah, I have. Not, I mean, I still do today. It's different. You know, it used to be restaurant work and customer service and swinging a hammer and construction. 
crawling around in attics, sweating my butt off, getting fiberglass in my butt too. That sucked. Now, I just sit in a secret lab chair all day long. Well, I also go out for real estate, but anyway. Uh, homeowners insurance market, freaking out. People are uh, losing it over the cost of homeowners insurance. Partly because you've had so many natural disasters like what we've seen in Hawaii, California, and Texas. Economist, the economist is now arguing that government subsidies of homeowners insurance over the last decade have caused people to live in high-risk areas who really should have moved. So basically you've distorted the normal economic flow of people once again because of government subsidies. Well, it's not a surprise because that's what the government essentially does. It screws things up. Parts of America are becoming uninsurable. Blame growth in hazardous areas, climate change, and bad policies. Basically go through how it would be cheaper to just live in areas less prone to storms, wind, or fire. Yet for decades, distortions in federal and state insurance markets have suppressed rates. Population of Florida, which suffers more hurricanes than other, any other state, grew more than twice as fast as it did between 2000 and 2020, uh, and 2020 over the last 20 years, basically. Americans are moving to riskier places. Well, Florida, like living in the beach, living in the beach area in Florida is pretty nice. Uh, Noah's premium. Oh no. <laughs> you know, the weather's great in SoCal. The beach is gorgeous in Southern Florida. Uh, Texas, the food's good. But anyway, it's not just extreme uh, weather to blame. You've also got more property claims and more lawsuits in some of these areas. Look at this. In 2021, Florida accounted for 7% of America's property claims, but 76% of the lawsuits. You know why? Older people like going to Florida. And you know what older people have a lot of? Time. This is what people say. You mess, you mess with a younger person. They might punch you in the face and they'll get over it and walk away. You mess with an older person. They will make it their job to, to finish business. <laughs> I mean, like, more power. I mean, like, I don't think an older person should get screwed much like I don't think a younger person. I don't think anybody should get screwed. But it's something to know. Like... I don't know if that's factual, okay? I am opining on this. I have to be really careful. I've got lots of licenses here, okay? When I say a fact, it needs to be backed by evidence. Like, when I put sources in my video descriptions or whatever, I have to be able to point to it so that when FINRA or the SEC or the FDIC or whatever license I go for in the future comes as like, where'd you get that data from? I actually have to have a way to support it. I mean, honestly, I think that's how all of YouTube should be because people say some crazy stuff and they're just sometimes straight up lying, and I'm like, man, I want to call this out so badly, but I, I, I'm not, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if we want to keep playing that game. Uh, I got an Apple video coming out, so make sure to stay tuned for the Apple iPhone video. The Nikki Haley plan, I'm going to give you a quick summary on this. Oh yeah, and then Bloomberg Intelligence on the housing crisis, but we've talked enough about the housing crisis. Nikki Haley's economic freedom plan is actually, honestly, a very well-written plan. I read through all of it. She talks about how China is an existential threat and they're basically planning for war and we need to make sure to go out of our way to prepare ourselves by being much more capable, by investing in America and staying ahead because freedom wins, not communism or socialism. And then she goes as far as calling Joe Biden basically socialism, which a lot of people are going like, come on, Kevin, he is. And then a lot of other people are going, come on, Kevin, it's not that bad, whatever. Talks about inflation, credit card debt being up 20%, price of used cars up 30%, half of America can't afford diapers, American family, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Th these are facts are true, but they've been true under Republican administrations as well. 42 million people on food stamps, 100 million people on Medicaid because they can't afford pay. I mean, sucks. Biden is throwing out our tax dollars at corporate welfare now, taxpayer bailouts, Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, honestly, the Inflation Reduction Act is giving massive subsidies to Enphase, Tesla, companies that probably don't need these subsidies, but it's all part of sort of going green. Uh, as an investor in both Enphase and Tesla, it's very hard for me to, like, in a non-biased way say, yeah, get rid of those subsidies. Because quite frankly, I'm like, I love these subsidies. Don't take them away. But realistically, like taking my bias out of it, you probably don't need these subsidies in the EV or uh, solar space because they make sense even without the uh, uh, subsidies. The subsidies just make it more of a no-brainer. Yeah. 
yeah, so I, I kind of agree here. Like, actually, I'm, I'm surprised. A lot of the Republican messages, I think they're going to make it really hard for people not to vote in a Republican this next time. Even the a lot, a lot of Democrats are like, well, I mean, look at this in Nikki Haley's plan. Completely eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax. That's 18 cents per gallon of savings on average and gas, 24 cents on uh, per gallon on diesel. If you're in California, that's more like a dollar, but that's the, the because the state adds so many taxes. Killing the gas tax, average American taxpayer should have a lower tax rate, especially middle classes, uh, the middle class Americans. She basically argues that the middle class is getting deleted by socialism and that the middle class is screwed. It's going to disappear. You'll have the rich and the poor. Honestly, even before she said this, I kind of thought we were going in that direction anyway, because the way capitalism is set up right now, outside of politics, really rewards the rich and punishes the poor. And uh, yes, jumping on that argument to argue that government policies can make that worse. I mean, that's debatable, but possibly has some merit. Anyway, this is some more of her plan. Imagine if Washington supported American energy instead of stifling it. This is basically drill, baby, drill. Pretty much every Republican saying this right now. Trump saying that. Vivek saying this. Everybody saying Joe Baby Drill. Joe Biden thinks he's protecting you from yourself. Instead, I trust you. I believe in you, a citizen of the United States, as the most inspiring and impressive person in the world. Oh, Nikki, that's so nice. Uh, of course, this is political, you know, jargon, uh, like the extent of which that some of this stuff matters. So that's why I'm kind of running through it and giving you the, the short scoop of it because it was a very long thing. It was like, it's good. It's a good read. It hits a lot of the right talking points right now. But uh, look, folks, times are tough. The, the toughness could stay. I expect a volatile Nike swoosh. I am not buying. So I just bought the dip yesterday. I'm not buying stocks right now thinking, oh, my actively managed ETF is going to have the best uh, returns in the world. I, I mean, you could obviously look at the returns so far. Uh, I, I don't want to talk about the returns because you start talking about returns, you get in trouble. Um, but I, I do believe wholeheartedly that uh, the investments, at least let me put it this way, I'll talk personally, where my money is going, I wholeheartedly believe will be substantially rewarded uh, in the next two to certainly 10 years. Uh, and I think that is a proper diversification through real estate and stocks. I highly believe that. You should be diversified to real estate in some regard. And a lot of people right now, they can't buy real estate. I think that's why, you know, our, our, the company we're working with on our fundraise is like, oh my gosh, this startup is getting a, like some of the greatest fundraising we've seen ever in its first just 48 hours. Okay, we just launched Wednesday night and it's, it's, it's been way better than expected in the first 48 hours. You know, we're coming up on 72 hours by the time this video will be posted. Go to househack.com obviously to read more. But my belief, not as personalized financial advice. We do give financial advice. We go to stackhack.com, we give financial advice. I've got like, 50 videos to film next week on people's situations. I've been working with the team on your situations. I'm like, wow, these are some impressive situations, but there are definitely places we can help you. That's the point. That's why we do licensed financial advice. Stackhack.com for licensed financial advice. But as not personalized financial advice, you should be asking yourself, how am I going to diversify to real estate over the next two years? And for a lot of us, it's not going to be putting 3.5% down on a house at 8%. It might legitimately be considering a real estate startup that could do it for you. And keep in mind, this is a real estate company. This is not a fund. I get messages. They're like, oh, so what are the, the AUM fees? Uh, you know, what, 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 on, on, on your assets under management. I'm like, there are no AUM fees. You're investing in a company. It's not a fund. You're investing in a company, a plan, a vision. And a great valuation too. So, anyway. Look, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. I got to go hop on a plane. Uh, my plane takes off in 28 minutes. So I got to go. Thanks so much, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Do not advertise these things that you told us here. I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take.